All right. So um, this morning, I uh, the focus of today's talk is going to be on um, specifically apophyseal injuries, both acute and chronic or uh, overuse. And we're going to talk a lot about the developing skeleton. Um, as Courtney said, I you know I'm one of our one of the non-operative pediatric sports medicine uh, providers in our group. I see a lot of the non-surgical injuries and a lot of uh, these injuries. And as we uh, enter into new territory in the next month or two, getting kids back on the field, I think we're going to see more and more of this. So hopefully, this will equip you with with some tools to use in your office um, and help you uh, manage some of these injuries. Uh, again, I. I encourage lots and lots of questions and I will take a little bit of a break about a third of the way through. Um, the, the basic structure today is gonna be, I'm gonna talk about apophyseal injuries in general, and then I'm gonna break down probably five of the most common ones that we see. All right. So today's goals are gonna be, how do you diagnose these injuries? How do you treat them? And things we can do to prevent them, um, especially as we, uh, bring kids out of hibernation and back into sports over the next couple months. So the anatomy of a developing bone. Um, so the physis is the growth plate. And again, I'm gonna kind of keep this pretty basic um, for, for those of us uh, in the group, um, just cause I think it's, it's good to keep things very simplified to understand these injuries. So the physis is the growth plate. So on this screen, it's right here. And that's where you get longitudinal growth. An apophysis, uh, and when you fracture a growth plate, it's a Salter Harris, one, two, three, four, et cetera. And those are the ones you're gonna see on radiology reports. And that's how we describe those. And we worry about um, you know, premature fu uh, fusion of the growth plate, et cetera. The apophysis is the growth center. So that is uh, usually um, responsible for bony contour, not necessarily longitudinal growth. Um, they tend to start appearing around age eight and they usually fuse in the mid twenties. So all the way into the college age. Um, and it's the attachment for muscles and tendons. So when the apophysis gets injured, it's usually an avulsion or a pulling traction injury as opposed to um, a Salter-Harris type fracture right through the growth plate. Um, and the injuries for an apophysis, they range from just inflammation um, and soreness to an avulsion fracture where the apophysis itself gets pulled away from the, um, the bone. The apophysis is very susceptible to repetitive physical loading and mechanical stress. So uh, things that you're doing over and over and over, um, the repetitive pulling of the tendon on the, on the bone or on the apophysis causes inflammation, again, because it's developing bone. So um, the, the muscle tendon attachment to the apophysis is really, really strong. So in the developing athlete, if they're gonna injure themselves in that region, it's rarely ever the muscle or the tendon, it's more likely to be the bone or the apophysis. Chronic repetitive traction causes inflammation. We call that apophysitis. Excessive force can then lead to an avulsion fracture. So sometimes I will have a kid who's had, you know, pain in that area for several weeks and then a sudden pain and a pop, and that's an acute on chronic. So they probably had some inflammation and then developed the fracture. Sometimes there's no preceding inflammation and it's just a fracture. Common sites that we see this are the elbow, the pelvis, the knee, and the foot. I'm gonna ignore the elbow today, um, partly because we have another talk coming up on the throwing athlete. Um, we are gonna see a bunch of it in the next couple months as baseball ramps back up. Um, but again, that's gonna be covered in a future talk, so stay tuned. Um, again, eight to 20, again, that is a very generalized age range, um, but I just wanted to throw it out there to kind of uh, mostly make sure you remember that the older athletes um, can have this as well. It's most commonly occur during rapid growth during that peak height velocity period of time. Uh, these injuries are frequently missed or diagnosed really late. Um, they're a lot of times felt to be a, a muscle pull or muscle strain and they're treated with rest and stretching and they don't respond well. Um, and then the last thing I, I always like to mention is, is this a disease? You'll hear me throwing out phrases like, Oscar Schlatter, Seavers, Iceland's. And in the in the the literature, it's called a disease, but it really isn't a disease per se. It is a, you know, it's a developmental condition. Um, so I like to make sure that, that my patients know that they don't have a disease, they have a condition that's gonna resolve with appropriate treatment. So generalized risk factors for apophyseal injuries, growth, which we talked about. So when um, when a kid or a teenager is going through rapid growth, their bones tend to grow um, and it takes a little bit of time for the muscle tendon units to adapt to the new length um, as well as the new 
uh, body mass that comes with growth. And so there's an inflexibility and an imbalance in strength that make athletes in, uh, more susceptible to, to uh, injury during this time, especially to the apophysis. Uh, muscular tightness, again, the growth causes tightness. Uh, the growing bones lead to tightness of the muscle tendon units. Sitting in your chair all day long, doing homeschooling um, and not getting up in between classes um, just accentuates this. So I just like to remind, we're seeing a lot of this in the office and it were, um, where uh, the normal getting up and down and up and down actually helped uh, this process of lengthening the muscle tendon union during growth. But now we're losing that as kids are spending more time sitting in their chair during the day. Um, and again, the hypothesis is the weak link. High activity volume, I'm seeing less of this now, but but in, but traditionally, this is what we see a lot of um, when the kids are see, you know, very, very involved in multiple sports or they're playing in several basketball leagues um, and their knees are really bugging them or they're playing basketball and volleyball. Just the volume of tension on that, uh, that developing bone causes a problem. Um, and that's why we need to be mindful of, and I'll talk about this again in prevention, mindful of training loads when kids are going through rapid growth, or if we see that it's coming, or if a kid comes into the office and they've grown four inches in the past year, just making sure that we're aware that this is a high risk time for them during injury and maybe just talking to them about what their training load is. It doesn't mean they have to stop their sports. It just means they have to watch the volume of the same movement over and over. So apophyseal injuries generally history, um, paying attention to their age can really help you figure out, you know, is this a developing bone problem um, or is this a, uh, or not? I mean, if you have an 18 year old with heel pain, they're probably not gonna think of Seavers. So just uh, understanding that recent growth, asking them that they have grown a lot recently, especially if you haven't seen them in a while. Um, activity, what are they doing? Has there been any recent increase? You know, I had an athlete uh, last week who came in and it came out in the kind of discussion. They didn't offer this up, but when we talked, kept talking to her, she had been a high level gymnast, had been off during most of uh, this quarantine COVID time and had just been back the last six weeks. And that's a, that's a huge jump to go from being off for eight months in gymnastics to back to activity. The exam is super important, um, as most apophyseal injuries are a clinical diagnosis. Um, bony tenderness is almost universal, um, so really examining where they're tender. They might come in and say, my hip hurts or my groin hurts or uh, my back hurts, and really it's a, a bony tenderness, so exam is super important. Sometimes there's some soft tissue swelling, but not always. Pain with resistant activation of the muscle group, so like it, for example, in this kid, if that's where they had pain, I would have them do a resisted sit-up to see if, or a sit-up just being without resistance, because that would put stress on that bone. Again, we'll talk about this specific injury in just a sec. Um, I check their range of motion and their flexibility. It's super, super important. And imaging and x-ray is usually the best study of choice. Um, and uh, a lot of times when kids come in um, and they've either self-diagnosed or been diagnosed with a muscle injury, they haven't had imaging, so imaging can be really helpful. Um, it's useful to actually look at the films. Um, an apophysis is considered a normal, you know, developmental um, part of the skeleton. And so a lot of times radiology will read the films as normal. Um, and sometimes what we're looking for are very subtle differences between right and left. So comparing the asymptomatic side and actually looking at the films yourself can be really helpful. Um, you're looking for avulsion, fragmentation, and any other cause. Um, so anything else abnormal on there that would explain things. Typically, by the time somebody comes to my office with these issues, I, I, I end up getting x-rays, but you know, I'm not always on the front line. Um, I'm usually their second stop. So um, you know, if there's no swelling and no bony tenderness and just some achiness after activity, I, I'm not sure that x-rays always are needed. Occasionally, I do use an MRI, um, especially if the diagnosis is a question. All right, so generalized treatment recommendations. Um, unfortunately, they rely a lot on clinical experience and expert opinion. There is not a lot of research um, or really good studies. Um, there's very limited quality studies, lots of case reports, lots of reviews. Um, activity modification, relative rest, offloading, stretching, icing. Those are kind of the, the mainstay of treatment. I'm gonna get more into specifics for different body parts here in a minute. Education is also important just for the, to educate the, the athlete and the family about what this is, how long it's going to last. And I, I find once they have that information, they make better choices at home um, as to how to manage it. Um, and early detection is very key so that you can manage it better and get them back to activity in a modified fashion sooner. 
All right, so today the ones I'm going to talk about on the pelvis um, are going to be the a anterior inferior iliac spine, the anterior superior iliac spine. So again, uh, right here on the front part of the pelvis, we're going to also talk about the, the ischium, which is down where the hamstring attaches, and the iliac crest. So those are the four that we're going to talk about. They're in this order because this is kind of the age which they develop, generally speaking. Uh, in the knee, um, we're going to talk about the tibial tubercle. We're going to talk about the patella, the foot, the calcaneus, and the fifth met. You can see that they also have these other names, Osgood, Simning, Larsen, Johansson, Sievers, Iceland. Those are all surgeons who have first described the condition. Uh, most of these were in the early 1900s. So um, feel free to call them whichever you prefer. All right. In general, um, these happen in a kind of a sequential developmental order. Um, so in the younger kids, you're going to see more of the, the Sending Lars Johansson, Iceland's and Sievers. In the older kids, you're going to see more of the Iliac Crest and Ischium. Um, so just being aware of that can be helpful in making the correct diagnosis. So before I dive into a specific body part, I'm going to ask Courtney, because I can't see if there's any questions that I uh, should ask at the, to answer this moment. We don't have any right now, but let's give it a second to see if anyone has anything. And again, make sure you use the Q&A um, chat function. You can just type it in and click send. We'll give you a couple seconds. Okay, I think all, all right. I think we're good. Yep, keep going. Okay, so we're gonna tackle these uh, four locations on the pelvis real quick, not real quick, but in a timely fashion. So um, understanding which muscles attach to which uh, part of the pelvis uh, is helpful in uh, um, making the diagnosis and, under and your exam as well. So the iliac crest, which is up here, is where your abdominal muscles attach. The anterior superior iliac spine, or ASIS, is where the sartorius attaches, which is responsible for hip flexion, um, kicking the ball, sprinting, et cetera. The AIIS, which is lower down, um, and it, it does fall kind of right on top of the groin area, um, is where the AIIS attaches. And then lastly, the ischium um, is where the hamstrings attach. I always tell the kids, think I'm in the office, this is the bone you sit on. Um, so the apophyseal injuries, there's a wide degree of severity from, hey, I have a little soreness to, oh my gosh, I can't walk and I'm in the emergency room because I think I've broken my hip. Um, it's a force eccentric pull. They may or may not hear a pop um, of all of the in, uh, apophyseal injuries. I think the pelvis is the one that we get the report of, I felt a pop most commonly. And again, frequently diagnosed as a, missed, as a pulled muscle, not necessarily by medical personnel, but by the families at home. Um, my most recent kid I had come in last week, um, actually had the injury five, four weeks ago, um, was treated at home, thought he was better, went back and re-injured. I don't think the most recent injury was the avulsion. I think it was just premature return. Um, so when we look at the iliac crest, so this is a little bit of an older uh, high school type of an injury, um, all the way into college. I had uh, college athletes when I was doing my fellowship with this injury. The oblique muscles um, attach to the iliac crest. The mechanism of injury is usually a twisting of the trunk, either repetitive or, or sudden. So like throwing in lacrosse, I had a lacrosse athlete um, who had chronic issues. Um, dynamic valgus and distance running. So if you have somebody who's, you know, just joined the cross country team, because that's the first sport available, and they come in and they're having a lot of pain on the outside of their hip, um, and it's bony tenderness as opposed to on the lateral aspect of the hip or knee, um, that, that can happen just from the repetitive uh, pull of the obliques. Breaking a tackle in football or rugby is another common way for this to happen, um, just from the forced pull. Um, exam imaging, there's usually focal tenderness over the iliac crest. Sometimes there can be some adjacent soft tissue tenderness. Um, they may have an antalgic gait or have difficulty kind of walking and the sit up would hurt. So they're laying on the bed and they go to sit up, it's going to hurt. X-rays, again, important to look at it. You can see on this particular picture, on this side, the apophysis is nice and um, symmetric in its width all along. And then as it comes around here, it gets pulled away right there. This actually is coming down into where the ASIS is as well. But for the most part, the iliac crest um, is involved. 
sometimes uh, an MRI is indicated, um, rare, but this was a 16 year old lacrosse athlete who had chronic um, right lower quadrant pain and they actually went to the emergency room and went, uh, underwent an entire rural appy uh, workup and then eventually landed in an office and had an MRI and just showed diffuse swelling within the iliac crest as the cause of the pain. Similar story, this was a 15 year old female who uh, had an ultrasound to rule out an ovarian cyst prior to coming in. And you can see on her uh, x-ray, again, there is widening of the iliac crest right here as compared to this side. Uh, and that was the source of her pain. So treatment, pain control, this one's, a, this one's a tough one, pain control. It can take six to 12 weeks, depending on if it's acute or chronic. Sometimes the, the chronic ones just linger. For rudders, strengthening can be helpful once the acute pain has decreased before they go back to a large volume of running. I like to make sure that their core and their hip stabilizing muscles are strong so that they don't get into that repetitive valgus position and stress the iliac crest. All right, so that's iliac crest. So um, in the acute setting, somebody who comes in who has an acute injury, uh, it's really just rest. You're treating it like a broken bone um, and they don't necessarily need physical therapy. The, I, I reserve the physical therapy for the kind of the chronic ones, the runners, sometimes the lacrosse athletes if I need to work on their core strength. But for the most part with acute injuries in the iliac crest, it's just resting and treating it like a broken bone. And then a progressive return to sport once they're non-tender. All right, let's talk about these guys. They get confused a lot. Um, they live kind of close to each other in the pelvis. The AIIS or the inferior iliac spine tends to appear and get injured earlier than the anterior superior iliac spine. So the younger ones are the ones that I, you're, I'm looking more lower on. Although again, in boys especially, it can, it can creep into the older teens as well. The attachments basically, I mean, these are the, the attachments to each. It's the hip flexor muscles. It's the sprinting, kicking muscles um, that attach to this part of the pelvis. Same mechanism as all the other apophyseal injuries. Kicking a ball is a classic one. Sprinting is another one. Uh, sudden pop and pain are what we usually hear from the kids. Um, and the severity of symptoms really ranges from, oh, it's just a little bit sore to they're in a wheelchair when they get rolled into the office. So exam, um, focal bony tenderness, sometimes it's kind of diffuse along the anterior groin, um, but when you really dig in there, most of the tenderness is along the bone. Um, pain with active hip flexion, a lot of times they don't like to, to bring their knee up. Crutches, which I'll, talk, which I'll talk about in a second, sometimes active crutches make things worse. They a lot of times will prefer, prefer to just have a shuffling gait where they don't lift their knee up at all when they're walking. Um, Again, when you have an avulsion fracture, they're pretty uncomfortable. So an AP pelvis is the study of choice. Uh, it's kind of important that you make sure that the radiologist are, is, knows what you're looking for. I have cases where these are good pictures, but you can see on here, this is an AP pelvis. And if I was looking at the iliac crest, for example, I'd be really bummed because I can't really see it because of the shadow. Um, because the assumption is when you're doing an AP pelvis that you're looking at the hips. So making sure that radiologist is looking you know, for an avulsion fracture or pelvic is, is helpful. Um, this is a ASIS or superior iliac spine avulsion fracture. You can see the piece got pulled off right here um, as opposed to this side, which is intact. This one is the inferior. This is a kid from last week in, my, in the office um, who was the five week one, which was hurt and then rested and thought he was better. And again, it's subtle. It's not, you, you know, it, you, have, you definitely have to take a look at it and make sure you have the right films. The lower ones or the AIIS ones tend to displace less than the uh, and superior ones. And so sometimes you, you need to do an oblique picture if you're not quite sure. I, I don't add it on as my normal uh, imaging routine, but in the past I've used that sometimes to get a better look. Treatment, crutches and resting. So sometimes crutches don't work. Sometimes crutches make it worse because in order to have your foot clear the ground on a crutch, you have to have your knee bent, which is flexing your hip. So again, some of these kids prefer to just shuffle along with a limp. Spending time at home with their knee flexed and their hip flexed like this um, is actually probably the most comfortable position for these kids. And sometimes it's a week of that before they're able to comfortably get around. It can take several weeks to walk comfortably in some of the uh, significant acute injuries. Once they're pain-free with daily activity, they can start some rehab. It's really important that we let the patient and the physical therapist know that we have to let the fracture heal. 
So you don't want to be doing a lot of stretching. You don't want to be doing a lot of massaging. You want to let the bone have a chance to heal and then you can start some gentle rehab. This can take quite some time. And I usually tell kids six to 12 weeks, um, low level six to, to eight, but the, uh, sometimes with these getting back to full sprinting, full kicking can take up to 12 weeks. They usually heal without consequence. The biggest risk is recurrent injury. Uh, if there's an avulsion more than two centimeters. I usually have a discussion with the surgeons if they want to get involved. Um, usually this is a non-surgical injury. Um, the only ones that sometimes this gets involved is the, the ischium, but for the most part, most of these do not, do not uh, lead to surgical intervention. All right, moving on to the ischium or the butt bone. As I like to tell kids the bone they sit on. Um, this is the older kids. In girls, it's younger because their skeleton is obviously developing a little faster. It's the hamstring attachment. These are the injuries that I, the mechanisms I see, the accidental slip and do the splits um, on the ice, at a baseball game, sliding into base, et cetera, or the ballet dancer acrobat who's doing forced splits repetitively um, also can, can cause this injury. May or may not have a sudden onset of pain. Sometimes it's a slow, uh, insidious onset. Um, there's usually focal bony tenderness. Um, they usually don't come in and say, I hurt right up on the bone, but when you examine them, you'll feel that they're really sore there. They have pain with stretching. Pain with sitting um, is, a, is a telltale sign that you got a problem up there. Um, the x-ray can be subtle, but usually you see some uh, irregularity um, along the, uh, along the ischium right here. You can see this side looks different than that side. And again, it's super important to have a, a film that uh, really visualizes that area well. I have had cases where we've uh, progressed to an MRI. That in, the times that I've used that are um, when the x-ray is equivocal. Sometimes you don't really see that widening on there like you'd like to. Um, and the MRI can show the amount of, of swelling or edema. This particular one, I was a football player who his x-rays didn't look super impressive, but his symptoms were chronic and he was frustrated. And, and I think this was a, a really good way for us to document that it really was a developing bone, even though the x-ray didn't show it. Um, this is the one I find most commonly, uh, well, the iliac crest and the ischium are the ones that get missed a lot on x-rays. So treatment, pain control, limit sitting. Um, so the, a lot of times sitting on a hard chair is not super comfortable. So trying to either give them a cushion, a pad, or have them change their, their sitting position to off offload that area. Once they're pain-free with daily activity, I do like rehab for these ones um, as opposed to the iliac crest, um, just because the injury tends to be re uh, recurrent and um, the hamstring tends to be tight. And most of these kids, you can use some help figuring out how to loosen up their hamstring without actively stretching it and pulling on the apophysis even more. These ones take a long time to get better um, when they're significant. These ones, uh, surgical referral, this says two, th three centimeters. I like to, two to at least start the discussion with my colleagues. Um, there are long-term consequences from this one. Um, sometimes you get this really large callus formation um, or persistent pain. This is obviously an exaggerated uh, uh, case, um, but sometimes they, they can get a lot of callus formation there that can become, uh, lead to some chronic discomfort. So um, these ones, we, we watch a little bit more closely. Um, and again, if I have a, a big avulsion on this one, I, we chat with the surgeons. All right, moving on to the knee. Let's check my time, I'm doing well. Okay, knee, these are the common ones. Osgood is the most common probably. Um, the tibial tubercle apophysis, it's on the front of the knee. Tip 10 to 15 is when it's injured. Usually we start seeing it a little bit before that. The attachment is the patellar tendon which is right here, attaches here. There's a pulling force uh, superiorly um, to that apophysis. The mechanism of injury, repetitive microtrauma, inflammation, microfracture, as the body tries to repair it, it causes enlargement of the tubercle. This is one of the one, few that lead to kind of long-term physical deformity um, that you can see within the tibial tubercle. The risk factors are rapid growth, um, Training that is a sudden increase in squats, lunges, and plyometrics, that one can do it. Um, tight hip flexors and quads that develop from prolonged sitting like this dude's doing right here. Um, kids now coming into the office, I again, this is a generalization, but tend to be weaker in their core, 
their glutes and tighten their hip flexors. And that, believe it or not, does contribute to the knee pain as they get back into activity. I tend to see Osgood, and I'm not sure this, yeah, I tend to see it um, in two different types. Sometimes uh, in the really inflamed acute setting when they're growing, um, the apophysis is wide open. I also tend to see it towards the end of growth and development when the apophysis is just starting to fuse and close down. Um, and that's in kind of the older teen girls and it's more of an achy throbby pain uh, after activity. Um, I do, so, but the ones that, the classic one is the younger kid during rapid growth with the big swollen um, soft tissue prominence along the tibial tubercle. Uh, bony tendinous, bony prominence, soft tissue swelling. Here's an x-ray picture of a kid with Osgood slaughter and you can see that there's some fragmentation extending up into the patellar tendon. Um, this is an MRI that was done of a kid who had pretty significant symptoms. Um, I rarely do an MRI unless I'm concerned about something else um, in the area. Uh, usually x-ray is sufficient. X-rays can be helpful for us to kind of look at the bony development and kind of get an idea of how much longer this is going to last for them. Treatment, activity modification, position change. So if you're a catcher, changing to a different position in lacrosse, if you're doing a lot of running, maybe taking a couple of weeks of playing in goal. Same with soccer. Um, basketball, if your knees are bugging you, avoiding doing defensive slide drills where you're having to really get down into a squat for repetitive motion. Ice and NSAIDs can help quad and hamstring stretching, rolling, patellar tendon strap. I would say half the time kids find it helpful, half the time it's not particularly useful and it kind of gets in the way, but it's definitely worth trying. It's an inexpensive intervention. Long-term, the symptoms typically resolve once the apophysis fuses. Um, sometimes they develop these painful, these ossicles that lead to persistent pain um, and the surgical removal is needed. Um, I think I removed this slide, but I had a kid when I was a fellow at Stanford, who was a college uh, soccer player who fell on the front of his knee and really irritated this area and, and ended up having to go in and have it debrided. So, I, you know, also when they develop a painful, a, a large lump on the front of their knee, it can provide, it can cause issues with jobs in the future where they're having to do a lot of kneeling on their knees or squatting activity. So it's definitely something we don't want to push through and develop big knobs on the front of your knees. Um, but managing it usually does the trick. So, um, SLJ, as we like to call it, um, is a it's the very similar injury, similar mechanism, but it happens earlier. It's much less common, and it's on the inferior pole of the patella. Um, the tender, it, it can be acute or chronic. Sometimes kids will come in and they you know, landed or jumped and had a sudden pain. Sometimes kids will come in and will just be sore there. They usually have very classic tenderness right there at the distal pole. It's not a great place to get poked anywhere. I mean, it's kind of a sensitive area. So I always like to compare it to the other side, but if there is asymmetric tenderness, it raises uh, that concern in, you know, for me. Um, usually they have pain when they flex their knee. Um, it can be confused with a patellar sleeve fracture, which is basically a, a fracture of the, the inferior pole of patella that involves a lot of the, car, the cartilaginous portion. So sometimes it can be a little tricky. Um, if there's any displacement like that, we definitely want to get uh, the ortho group involved. Um, an MRI can sometimes be helpful to figure out the degree of injury in those cases. Um, these ones, this is one of the few times I will use a knee immobilizer for pain control. So the more they bend their knee, um, the more uncomfortable it is. And so sometimes in the very acute setting for these kids, these younger kids, um, I will, uh, I'll use a knee immobilizer for a week or so to really let the area calm down. Now, obviously if it's a patellar sleeve fracture, then that becomes more of a permanent treatment. Um, crutches again, has the same issue as the hip with the knee bent. It's sometimes uncomfortable to hold the knee in a flex position. So sometimes a knee immobilizer and weight bearing is actually more comfortable. All right. I see the Q and A's uh, increasing. And so I'm looking forward to answering those. We're gonna get the last two down here at the foot and then we'll tackle the questions. Sievers, okay. Um, calcaneal apophysitis, the younger kids, attachment of the, both the Achilles and the plantar fascia. So it's it's got both components. Um, the impact of hard landing on the on the bottom of the heel, as well as the pulling from the Achilles and calf muscles are what causes inflammation at the growth plate. 
things that contribute to this issue are tight, tight calf muscles during, that occur during growth, increased activity, so new sport, new season. Um, you've been sitting a lot and then you get up to start running. Suboptimal shoes, cleats, running that mile in the vans during PE can really cause problems. Um, and kids who pronate a lot. So the history is typically heel pain that's worse with running, um, worse in cleats, better with a supportive running shoe, worse when they're barefoot around the house. Um, sometimes they'll come in kind of walking on their toes, trying to avoid any pressure on their heels, changes in running gait sometimes. Exam usually shows pretty classic tenderness along the posterior aspect of the calcaneus, both medial and laterally. Um, the classic squeeze test, which is what this person's doing, usually elicits pain. Um, sometimes there's some pain extending up into the Achilles tendon, but most of the pain is usually in the bone. X-rays can show a sclerotic uh, fragmented apophysis. That can be normal, um, but there is some evidence that fragmentation does correlate with symptoms. Uh, you don't have to x-ray every single case. If it's pretty classic um, and mild, then just intervening and, and watching for symptoms to resolve is, is sufficient. Um, I we typically would x-ray for persistent pain, atypical pain, or severe pain. Um, so activity modification for, for receivers is minimizing your running in your cleats. Um, sometimes changing from a cleat to a turf shoe, sometimes wearing your running shoes to practice as opposed to your cleats can be helpful. There's really two mainstays of footwear modification, either heel cups or arch support. And the, I would tell you that it's, it's all over the map as far as what is recommended. It's also uh, very um, specific to the patient of what works the best. Um, I'm gonna talk about that in just one second. Stretching of the gastroc is also important. This is one of my more favorite calf muscle stretches that was taught to me by my uh, awesome PTs we had in the office, so thank you. Ice after activity, an ice bath works best. The calcaneus is a kind of a round bone. And so trying to put an ice bag on there is not super effective. I'm a big fan of a, a bucket of ice water for 10 minutes after practice. Um, ask my kids, they, uh, they're gonna have nightmares about it, I think when they're older. Um, so sometimes we will mobilize with a boot or a cast. I, I know um, in significant cases, in non-compliant kids, um, like I can't get around school because my heel hurts so much, things like that. But most of the time, just switching them into a good pair of shoes and starting and modifying their activity is sufficient. Treatment's not curative. They, you just basically manage it until the foot's done growing um, and, and not skeletal maturity of the whole body of the foot. Um, I find that when kids are really, feet are growing fast, this, this is the most problematic. There really aren't any long-term sequelae of, of sievers. I mean, once it, once that bone heals, kids are, are typically uh, pretty well off. All right, so arch support versus cushion. There was a, a recent article um, in the British Journal of Sports Medicine. They looked at 125 patients, um, trying to figure out which one worked better. The thought process is the cushion elevates the heel and takes the stress off the Achilles tendon. It also minimizes the impact to the bottom of the calcaneus. The downside of these is they tend to slide around a lot in your shoes. So in a sport where you're changing direction a lot, it feels uncomfortable sometimes. The other option was some sort of prefab arch support. Um, in our office, you know, we talk about Superfeet a lot. There's several other products that are similar. Um, the results in two months time, the heel pain, the heel cups, did help more with the pain, but a year out, there was really no difference um, between the two. So uh, the, the conclusion of the, the, the study was that the selection choice should be made on clinical judgment, cost and patient preference. So again, um, if the kid has come in and they've already tried the heel cups and it hasn't helped, I might try this. If they have significant pronation, um, I might just go straight to this. Um, it kind of just depends on the kid, what shoes they're wearing, what sport they're wearing, if they're pain, uh, happens in cleats and this is something like this is a 10 to 15 dollar investment see if it works if it doesn't work something like this is more of a 40 to 50 dollar investment so uh, again kind of depends on what they've had and what they've tried um, to see what helps them more um, I, I tend to do more of the arch support um, than the heel cups but I take it patient by patient last but not least is Iceland's um, and it's a traction apophysitis at the base of the fifth. So I feel like I'm saying the same thing over and over and I kind of am, but it's just a different body part. 
This one uh, is a kind of the younger um, preteen. It's where the perineal tendon attaches. Um, usually it's an apophysitis, a gradual onset, or it can happen with an ankle inversion. Um, you and I, we would probably have a, you know, break the bone, have a Jones fracture. Kids tend to have this injury. It's oriented um, longitudinally or in the same direction as the bone. Um, it's frequently confused with fracture. I, I get kids that come in all the time that think they have a fracture and this is what they have and it's non-tender and that, that is, then that um, kind of rules that one out. So which one's the fracture? A fracture tends to go this way. And we do see these fractures in these kids this age. In fact, this one, well, the next slide was a kid this week. So I saw this exact case uh, this week where the apophysis is present. It's not a bolster widen, but this is not a fracture. This is not the fracture. This is the fracture. Okay, this is just the apophysis. So ankle inversion with lateral foot pain or insidious onset lateral foot pain, swelling along the outside of their feet, a prominence, you know, mom wants to know why they have this big bump on the outside of their foot and it's tender to the touch. There's never been an injury. It doesn't hurt with sports. Um, that's a pretty common story I hear. Oh gosh, that didn't turn out too well in the picture. This one right here, you can see there's a, a line coming across here. That was the fracture this week. Um, also had an apophysis. It was not a problem. Um, Usually you need three views um, to really see the apophysis well. Um, the oblique is where you see the apophysis the best. Um, and just make sure that you know, when, you're, when you're examining a kid, you, you take a look at the pictures to try to figure out which one's which. So if it's just um, a non-displaced, not an avulsion fracture, and it's just inflammation, that's activity, modif activity modification. The kids that are really sore or um, had an avulsion fracture, we usually use a boot for those kids. Um, in kids who it's a chronic condition, sometimes doing calf muscle strengthening and um, proprioceptive exercises can really help. Um, in the acute setting, I don't find that I use that. Once the, once the avulsion fracture heals, they usually do just fine. The other thing to remember is sometimes um, in these kids who have chronic uh, Inflammation in that area, making sure that their shoes aren't too narrow, that they're not putting mechanical pressure on there can also help. Long-term complications are uncommon, but definitely do happen. And this was a kid actually that I took care of at Stanford who um, had a, a one that didn't fuse. So basically the apophysis um, didn't, you know, she had a chronic apophysitis down here. It never fused. When she was in college, it was symptomatic and they ended up putting a screw across it. Um, very, very, very unusual, but cool case. So looking forward, um, if anybody's you know wants a nice review, this was a nice review that I, I uh, that I think is helpful. There's really limited studies um, in in understanding this. Um, the diagnosis is is clinical, and the treatment is based on expert opinion. So uh, I'm sure there there's um, probably some more opinions about things that we can do, um, but for the most part. Um, the, uh, the treatment plan of attack is similar for all of them. Um, future research directions, I think some risk factors as kids are more active in sports and we're seeing more of these and diagnosing more of them, understanding what puts the kids at risk and how to prevent that. Um, treatment options, the question about aggressive immobilization, are, are we really better off immobilizing these kids? Um, so somebody who has uh, uh, Sievers, for example, some people uh, in some clinics will take those kids and put them in a cast for four weeks just shut them down and then take them out of the cast, start some rehab, get the range of motion back. And once they have full range of motion, let them go back to sport. Don't really know if that has a better outcome um, and actually is a faster way to treat it than limping along for three months with chronic mild pain. Um, so that'd be an interesting thing to, to look for. In, in my clinic, I tend to not immobilize and treat more with an active approach. Um, and then also helping coaches, parents, um, anticipate the rapid growth phase and modify their training appropriately during that time. I think it'd be really useful. All right, now it's time for questions. So um, Courtney, would you like me to leave this up or do you want me to stop sharing my screen? Uh, maybe leave it up just in case we need to go back to anything, but um, right. do you want cool. me to read off the questions for you? Oh, I haven't, I haven't even opened them yet. Oh no, I can do it right here. I see them all. Okay, um, perfect. Are there any racial patterns of apophyseal sites that have a greater predilection towards injury or conversely lower rates? Not that I'm aware of other than, um, uh, you know, really just watching the, um, 
the sometimes I find well sometimes not, not fine the growth pattern. So if you if the bony maturity sometimes depending on their growth patterns if they you know if they've grown um, if their skeletal maturity is further along younger then they're going to have they're not going to necessarily follow the rules of hey Osgood slaughters this age uh, vice versa. But not I nothing that I was aware of that was written at all in the literature. Um, is there a website or resource or specific stretching exercises to recommend to patients, especially exercises specific certain sports and specific apophysial injury? Um, we, gosh, um, we have, so like in our office, we have some handouts that, that we use, one for Seavers um, and one for the knee, the knee pain. We also have some really nice um, COVID return to sport handouts that I'm sure that we could share um, to the group. Um, the, there's a website, Stop Sports Injuries, and they have some nice patient, uh, patient information as well. It's STOP uh, Sports Injuries, and it's a, um, a large organization that, that's working on injury prevention for athletes. What sort of exercise warm-up will help prevent ASIS injuries in athletes, like a soccer player? Um, so dynamic warm-up is... Um, all right, so I'm sorry, I got distracted. Um, dynamic warm-up is probably the most important thing. So I think when they cut, get to the field, making sure that they don't just jump on and start playing, or sometimes I see kids show up at practice and just start hitting long balls, and that's really not a great idea. Um, so making sure they go through a jog, stretch, high knees, butt kicks, anything that's dynamic. And then maybe, especially uh, if somebody's feeling some tightness in their hip flexors, some really focused stretching, static stretching right before training, like a, a lunge kind of a stretch. Um, but honestly, I think the dynamic warm-up probably is the most effective. Where should you suspect the injury with medial thigh pain and tenderness? Well, there is um, there is a, several other apophyseal, apophyses on the pelvis that I did not talk about because they're much less common. Um, one is along the lesser trochanter um, where the psoas attaches, that can be a, a problem. Um, so um, also along the pubic symphysis, um, you can get some uh, inf uh, growth plate inflammation along there. So that's the, those are the areas I would look on x-ray um, to look to see if there's any bony abnormality. Are you planning to share the presentation with the attendants after? I think so, I think it's recorded. Um, also the best approach for a back injury, um, that's, um, <laughs> that's a big question. Um, a back injury, an acute injury is kind of um, imaging and assessment. The chronic low back pain, I would say the first place I always start is hamstring flexibility. Um, after that, you know, this is a, a, I think we're having a back talk from Dr. Policy. So I think I would suggest we table that until that talk. For Osgood, lateral x-ray is best. Yes, if you're 100% confident that you're just dealing with Osgood slaughter and you don't have any other issues going on. Um, but when we actually the knees, especially if they haven't had any imaging before, um, we uh, do three views, always do three views of the knee, AP lateral and notch um, for the younger ones. Can kids continue to be as active as their pain will tolerate with Osgood slaughter? So I typically tell the kids if they're, if the pain is getting progressively worse, if they're limping, or if once they get home from practice, they're scooting around on their butt because they don't want to walk, then they need to slow it down. If it's something that they're able to run and play and do everything they want at practice, but they come home and they're just a little sore and they ice and they feel okay when they get up the next day, then I'm okay with them continuing with their current activity level. But I definitely would not, um, if they're limping or hobbling around or miserable and changing their gait, it's time to slow it down. What causes this mechanism of injury since there are no muscle attachments? I'm not sure what this one is referring to. Um, I think it was probably in the middle of the talk. Um, it's probably probably because there's a tendon attached there. They all have a tendon, a tendon attached. Um, this was at 8.30, I was probably talking about the knees. It's probably the patellar tendon um, is indirectly connected basically to your quad muscles. Can you review where the pain is located for iliac crest injuries? Um, anterior, posterior, both. So the most common area is right on the, um, the anterior and superior aspect of the iliac crest. It rarely ever goes posterior, um, but it can be quite lateral. So the lateral aspect of the iliac crest up high, that's where it can be anywhere from there all the way kind of to the front, um, 
so more anterior. So it's a wide area there, but not posterior usually. Do I recommend an MRI or a CT for um, SLJ? Uh, great question. Um, typically an MRI um, kind of depends on what we're dealing with. An MRI is gonna do a little bit better job. Um, I, and again, if it's clinical and I can see it on an X-ray, I don't need to do the advanced imaging. But if I'm gonna do advanced imaging, I usually will start with an MRI. Can severe Severs disease lead to Achilles rupture? Um, not that I'm aware of. I do think that the risk factors that lead to somebody from having Severs also would lead them later on to have Achilles. So if you have really tight calf muscles and you develop Severs when you're growing, probably could have Achilles tendonitis later. Um, so addressing whatever risk factors led, but I haven't heard of any cases. If it has, if it has happened, it's gonna be uh, very unusual. Um, but usually there's not meant, that's not something that's commonly reported. PRP injections in teenage patients. Um, <laughs> I don't know if Dr. Shea is on here um, or not uh, as part of an attendee, but um, the, uh, I actually think we, I think that's part of one of our talks uh, coming up. Um, that is a complicated one. The science doesn't really support it right now. Um, and I think until we have better, uh, better science saying that uh, it's helpful, um, we typically um, don't recommend it frequently. So I wouldn't say it doesn't ever happen, but don't recommend it frequently. Uh, same question about Seavers. Is it okay to play with pain? Same thing. Um, I actually think with Seavers, the risk of it becoming a bigger problem is less than Osgood. So I let the Seavers kids play through uh, more pain, but again, I'm very sensitive to them changing their gait because as soon as they start changing their running gait, it causes all sorts of other problems. For mild to mild in cases of Seavers, is complete rest from activity necessary or just modification? Again, I typically just do modification um, unless they're just miserable and they're walking in on their toe. If they're walking in on their toe and you can't put any weight down, I'll usually be aggressive with hold, pulling them out for a couple of weeks, putting them in a boot, letting things calm down and then reintroducing. But if it's mild and they, they're walking in and they just say it hurts when they're running the mile of PE, then I'll usually just modify. Seavers is the, is the popular topic here. Um, for Seavers, would the approach or treatment be different if the pain is located in the first metatarsal? Absolutely, that's probably a different problem. Uh, do you have any guidance on how much symptom improvement kids should have regarding Seavers after a few weeks to help manage expectations? Um, there should be some improvement. I, I, I don't have a quantifiable amount, but I usually tell them there should be some improvement. And if there's not, then you, you can stop using it. If you don't have improvement after a week with an intervention like that, then you've got to be more aggressive with your activity modification. About the Osgood, how to differentiate it with a ligament injury. So Osgood is usually going to be a chronic pain that's very focal, that's below the knee and on the, kind of the top of the shin bone. A ligament injury inside the knee is usually going to be more pain within the knee and a lot of times we'll have joint swelling associated with it. What about pain control with kids with GI or renal issues that aren't a candidate for NSAIDs? Ice, 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 ice. Ice, immobilization um, tend to work the best for them. I don't encourage the NSAIDs um, unless, like I don't, I don't recommend they take Advil or Motrin and then go play. Um, but if they come home from playing and they're really sore and miserable, that's when I use them. And again, in a kid who, who that's contraindicated, I think um, being really aggressive with the ice can be, work just as well. Do we expect kids with Osgood or SLJ to have symptoms until they are done growing? Um, not, so not done growing until that part of the skeleton is, is done growing. So for an SLJ, that part of the, the patella um, finishes its development way before the kid's done growing. Um, same thing with Osgood. You know, Osgood, um, that fuses before, a lot of times will fuse and, and become asymptomatic before the kid has finished their skeletal maturity. All of the above isn't just apply on kids, right? All ages are using the same treatment. Um, we typically don't see apophyseal injuries in adults. They usually are done by the time the kids hit college because the skeleton is fused. Um, first slide again for ASIS. I can in just a second. Let me scroll through the rest of these questions and then I can uh, I can do that. There's a lot of them here. Um, 
Would you advise against a specific sport, a football player, to choose another sport if they have Osgood? Not necessarily. I might have them change positions for a little while until their knee's done maturing. So if they're in a position where they're doing a lot of squatting, um, then uh, switching it up might be helpful. How does obesity or significant weight gain affect apophysitis risk or pathology? Great question. Um, we tend to see also I, more in, in kids who have a large, uh, higher BMI. Um, I think it just puts increased stress on the developing skeleton. Makes it also harder to uh, help them improve their physical fitness because it hurts when they move. So those can be really tricky. I, I have a couple cases uh, that have, uh, I've really gotten to know the families well because we, we, we work over time um, being really creative in activities to get them fit first and then do impact. So these kids who have Osgood who are have issues with obesity, you, you basically take away running as a way to help them get fit. So you have to stick more with cycling, swimming, and walking. During initial exam, what is the biggest indicator that the pain is from an apophyseal injury as opposed to a muscular injury? Bony tenderness. So you really got to dig in there. Um, so on a physical exam, it's definitely bony tenderness. Also high, um, high level of suspicion in the developing skeleton. It's just more common to injure the bone than the proximal tendon. So if you were up in, you know, examining up in the hip and there's any evidence of bony tenderness, then you got to get an x-ray. Answered that one, answered that one. Ah, thoughts prefab versus custom orthotics. I tend to do prefab because the kids are growing and the customs are expensive. Um, and kids who clearly need them, we try to limp along in the prefabs until their feet are done growing. And then I, th then I uh, consider the customs at that point. Familial tendency, yes. For Osgood, that's the one that, is there a familial tendency in these injuries? There's some. Some evidence that Osgood slaughter tends to run in the family. So I usually if they're, a lot of times, the, especially the boys will come in and say their dad had this as well. Is there any underlying systemic illness that predisposes kids for these injuries or are some patients presenting with history of multiple sites? That's a great question as well. I'm not aware of any underlying systemic illness um, that for, basically apophysitis at multiple locations. And yes, I see it all the time. I see kids coming in when they're younger and they have sievers and they come in later and they have knee pain. And I, I, I tell them I'm a broken record here. I'm gonna tell you the same exact story, but a different part of your body. So yeah, I have patients who you know, unfortunately get it in several different locations. Um, any topical agents like topical NSAIDs? I typically don't use the topical uh, NSAIDs. I typically use uh, ice for my treatment modality of choice. All right, I think I'm through all of these, Courtney. A lot of yeah, questions. it looks like it. If you if you didn't mind showing that slide, that oh yeah yeah okay um, real quick, and then we'll wrap up. Were there any that I, yeah, I don't think I'm gonna think I got them all. No, you got them. Okay. The first slide that shows all the butt muscles on it. Um, I'm trying to find that one again. This one? Is it, well, probably this one, that one. Okay. Perfect. And the question who is, somebody asked about medial thigh pain. So on here, you can see there is an, there is an apophysis here. And there is one here. I just didn't talk about them because they're much less common. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Boyd, for joining us this morning. Thank you, everyone else, for joining us for this talk.